Hi everyone, we are making our way to the end of this textbook and uh, after this chapter we only have one more to go. So in this chapter we're going to be covering the control of microbial growth which is going to include a discussion on the lines of defense of the human body. We'll compare and contrast innate adaptive and herd immunity, which we have talked about in A&P already. So for most of us, that should be a review. We will also review active and passive immunity. Again, should be um, pretty familiar to us. And then lastly, will distinguish between disinfection, decontamination, and sterilization. All right, I'll see you there. Okay, here we are, so we made it. Um, one thing that I just want to mention is, as I was kind of reading through the threaded discussions about the immediate use steam sterilizer, I saw some comments about we want to make sure that we keep things as sterile as possible, or it might not be as sterile. So my question for you, and hopefully you'll be able to answer this by the time we get to the end if I've done my job correctly, um, are there varying degrees of sterility? That is my question for you. So let's see if we can figure that out by the time we come out on the other side. Before we move forward, I just want to do a quick review of what we've learned so far about the strategies that are within our abilities to control as far as microbial growth. So the first thing that we learned, among many things, it's just kind of overarching concepts, is that microorganisms have a specific nutritional requirement. If we can identify what that is and remove it, we can kill it important. The second thing, microorganisms thrive in a specific environment. Maybe they like air, maybe they don't, maybe they don't care. Um, either way, if we can determine what those specific environmental requirements are, again, that um, enables us to fight it better. We've also learned that the majority of microorganisms are opportunistic. Think of all the commensals that uh, live on us and inside us and in symbiosis for the most part, unless we give them the opportunity to become pathogenic. The next thing is, is that our skin is our first line of defense. We have been talking about this for a while now, that the integrity of our skin is extremely important because it is our first offender. We've also realized that a healthy immune system is key. I think we have uh, read over and over and over again and had just several discussions about this that the, the uh, immunosuppressed, the immunocompromised populations are the ones that are at the higher risk for developing diseases or infections due to these pathogenic microorganisms. Also, microorganisms are transmitted via specific routes, right? If you can figure out how a disease is transmitted and remove that ability for it to access that route, cha-ching, right? We stay healthy. If we break the chain of disease of transmission, we break the chain of disease. I think that we know hand washing is one of the, the easiest ways that we can break the chain of disease transmission. Any place along that chain, we interrupt that, we're good to go. We also talked about standard, universal, and transmission precautions, right? When I think about standard and universal precautions, I think about everybody has something that I don't want to get. And so I'm going to use those same principles with grandma and baby and anybody in between. I don't want to take that home with me, right? And then transmission precautions. This is important for us to know to protect us, ourselves, 
but also if let's say we have an isolation patient and we're moving them from the ICU to the OR, we have to think about do they need a mask? Do they, you know, what are those um, situations uh, for the patient as well so that we can protect other people in the hospital? Aseptic technique. We have, um, you know, scoured aseptic technique. We haven't got to the actual applying of aseptic technique, but we are beginning to understand the principles and build that basic foundation that they're like the, um, the, the rules of engagement, right, for surgery. Very important, aseptic technique. Ability to study microorganisms in a controlled lab environment. This is how we understand them, right? And our experiments have kind of helped us gain uh, a, an understanding of how these microorganisms work, how they thrive. And we also learned that some of them, like Trapanema pallidum, um, has never been grown in a lab environment without a live host. So um, the, the more easier they are to study and, and grow in a controlled environment, the more easily we can understand them and learn to fight them. Proper hand washing. We talked about that. Um, how proper hand washing is the basis for breaking the chain of disease. And then lastly, vaccines. It is so important for us to vaccinate ourselves, vaccinate our children, vaccinate our pets to make sure that we are being responsible as far as um, limiting the transmission of diseases. We've learned a lot. Give yourselves a pat on the back. So we already know that our skin is the first line of defense. So first line that we're gonna talk about is the human body. Our second line of defense is blood and chemicals. And our third line of defense is immunity. So we're gonna talk about all of those uh, separately here. So as I mentioned, our first line of defense is the human body. These are things that we're born with and they're referred to as the innate immune system. Innate meaning we were born with it and it's also considered a natural defense or a non-specific defense. So it really protects us against anything and everything. It's not selective. Like we're gonna talk about the other lines of defense and some of them are selective, right? When we have like antibodies that respond to an invader's antigens or the chemicals that they produce. So the um, first line of defense is innate and it's non-specific. And those consist of internal and external boundaries or barriers such as the skin and mucous membranes and various secretions. Also the environment of certain areas like the stomach with its very low pH, the, the pH of the skin as well. So these um, uh, barriers help to ward off these pathogenic microbes. Um, again, the more we can care for our skin and uh, make sure that it is not cracked or torn or ripped or burned or blistered or anything like that, the better it will be at protecting us. Some other contributors, cilia, Remember the, the cells that line the respiratory system, they have this special little cilia that acts like this escalator that helps to push debris up and out. Um, lactic acid, fatty acid, secretions we talked about, um, and then also urination, right? Elimination of things. We also um, shed bacteria in our feces as well. Our second line of defense has to do with our blood and substances within our blood, such as 
um, fatty acids, prostaglandins, interleukins, various chemicals. Um, so phagocytes. Phagocytosis, remember, is the engulfing of particles, and phagocytosis helps to fight against foreign invaders because it en engulfs them, digests them, and gets rid of them for us. And some examples are macrophages and granulocytes. Blood proteins. Remember we talked about the complement cascade. And the complement cascade helps to break down bacterial cells. And uh, there's this sequence of processes that happens that causes an accumulation of fluid. And that continues until the lysis of the cell membrane occurs. Remember the, the, um, the C4 that drills the holes and allows fluid to come in until the cell ruptures or explodes. Prostaglandins are another example of blood proteins. You may have heard of immunoglobulins. And these guys are going to do a variety of things for us, um, such as um, control the immune response and inflammation, increase capillary permeability so that those cells that make up our defense can move around more easily and slip out of the uh, vessels to get to the tissues that need help. Um, they're also useful in the treatment of hyperacidity and uh, inflammatory um, processes. Now, interleukins are typically produced by our T cells and our macro Phages. These are white blood cells, remember. And uh, what they do is they, they are a chemical communication that serve to alert other cells in the immune system that there is danger and they need to attack. Interferons are proteins that are produced when white blood cells T lymphocytes and fibroblasts become infected. And these guys are called interferons because they interfere with replication within infected cells, specifically when we're talking about viruses. Now fever, fever, uh, it causes this, the, the hypothalamus resets, right? At a higher temperature. Remember the hypothalamus is like the regulatory center of our brain and it regulates so many things in our body. And um, with a fever, the hypothalamus resets at a higher temperature, hoping to kill off some of those bacteria by making it less inhabitable environment. And then our inflammatory response. Our inflammatory response begins when there is some sort of injury and our skin is damaged, let's say. So, um, you know, this whole process ensues where there's going to be platelets and chemicals and um, um, coagulation proteins that are going to rush to that area. Um, vasodilation is going to be promoted, right, so that we get more of those components to that site where it needs help. Um, macrophages are going to be attracted there due to something called chemotaxis, and swelling is going to result, right, because fluids are going to leave the circulatory system and enter the interstitial spaces, the spaces between the cells. And then we're gonna have edema, right, or inflammation. And now we have all of these dead and dying cells that were defending us. And um, some of them can be dead bacteria, others are dead um, phagocytes. That is what we uh, call pus, okay? When we get that yellowish, greenish, purulent stuff, that is basically comprised of dead cells. All right, so um, in this, um, um, this battle, let's say, 
to um, defend the body, we will see signs like swelling, redness, heat, and then symptomatically pain could be associated with that as well. Now our third and final line of defense is immunity. And this is very specific. Uh, we talked about um, our natural or innate immunity that's very non-specific. It doesn't differentiate, but our third line of defense is very specific. And so now we're going to talk about adaptive immunity. It also goes by acquired immunity because we're not born with it. We have to acquire it, okay? Just like we're not born with a car. We have to acquire one, right? We have to go get one. So we have to get this kind of immunity for our body. And uh, there's two types. There, um, there is uh, passive and active. So let's talk about passive immunity first. Each type of acquired immunity, uh, whether it's passive or active, can fall into two categories, natural and artificial. Now, when we're talking about passive adaptive immunity, we're talking about um, antibodies being formed in an individual that are transferred to another. The body itself is not producing the antibodies. Therefore, it is passive. Remember, passive means uh, in chemistry when we talked about passive transport or active transport. Active like you have pushing a rock up a hill. You have to use energy to do it. Passive meaning you're standing at the top of the hill and you give the rock a little shove and it goes all the way down, right? You don't have to do anything. So passive immunity means our body didn't do anything. And there's two ways that this can happen. Naturally, um, antibodies can be present in the bloodstream of the pregnant female and they can cross the placental barrier to the fetus or the, the, the neonate can acquire those antibodies through the breastfeeding process, all right? Artificial passive immunity is created by transferring antibodies from an immune person to a non-immune person or a susceptible person. So basically, you're just removing antibodies that have already been made from someone and then you're giving those antibodies to someone else. Their body doesn't have to do anything, you're just giving them a gift, okay? So passive adaptive immunity is a gift. Naturally, it can be a gift from mom, through the placenta, through the milk, or it can be a gift from someone else, uh, which would be uh, called artificial, okay? So that is passive adaptive immunity. Now let's talk about active. Remember, active means that our body has to do something. And there's two ways that this can happen. Again, the first way is natural, okay? And natural active adaptive immunity means that we were exposed to a disease, let's say chickenpox, okay? I get exposed to chickenpox I get chicken pox, and then my body has to go to work to fight off the varicella virus, okay? It has to produce antibodies. It's doing the work, but I naturally was exposed to it, okay? The second way is artificial, and that's where we're really talking about our vaccines, all right? We're gonna get a little tiny bit of a virus or a bacteria or whatever the case is, and our body is going to go to work to make antibodies to fight off that pathogen. And then later down the road, what is so awesome about uh, this whole process 
is that we have these memory cells and those memory cells never forget the antigen that they were designed to attack. So they just go hang out in the lymph nodes and um, they wait for that specific antigen to ever rear its head again. And if it does, then they go to work to fight it. That's why once we um, have this uh, acquired immunity, um, we are no longer susceptible. Now, with the passive um, natural adaptive immunity that we get from mom, that can um, not, that can be short term. All right, it's not always long lasting. So here's the difference between passive and active acquired immunity. Okay, time for the test. I got four examples here. We're gonna see if we can identify each type of immunity in each of these examples. So put your thinking caps on. Maybe rewatch the past slide, re-listen. Example number one, antibodies that cross the placental barrier to the fetus. Okay, we know that these are examples of adaptive or acquired immunity. So that's gonna be a given for each of these. But what we're looking for is, is it active? Is it passive? And within that, is it natural or artificial? What do you think? Antibodies that cross the placental barrier to the fetus. Going once, going twice. The survey says natural passive adaptive immunity. Remember, it's natural because we're getting it from a natural source, from mama, right? And it's passive because we didn't have our body didn't have to do anything to get those antibodies. Okay, mom mom gave us a gift either through the placenta or through the milk. All right, let's look at the second one. Example number two: An individual develops immunity after having the disease. Okay, is this like pushing a rock up a hill, or is this like pushing the rock down the hill? Active or passive? Natural or artificial? Let's see. If you guessed natural active adaptive immunity, you would be correct. It's natural because we were naturally exposed to the bugs, okay? It's active because our body had to go to work making antibodies to fight off those bugs. Number three. Immunity is acquired through a vaccine. All right, active or passive? Natural or artificial? Let's see now. Artificial, active, adaptive immunity. It's artificial because it was a vaccine. We weren't naturally exposed. Somebody had to poke us with something for us to get exposure. It's active because our body goes through the same process of having to build and manufacture antibodies that will fight off the foreign invader. Last one here. Plasma from a recovering patient is given to others. Is it active or is it passive? Does our body have to do work or does it not have to do work? Is it a natural source or an artificial source? Let's see. Artificial, passive, adaptive immunity. It's artificial because we, we didn't get it from a natural source. We weren't naturally exposed through mom or by being exposed to some bugs, all right? It's passive because our body didn't have to do any work to get that gift of antibodies that come in the plasma.
Okay, I hope that this helps. So let's talk a little bit about the components of the immune system. Two big buzzwords right now uh, because of this COVID pandemic are antigens and antibodies. Now antigens are the chemicals that an invader puts off, okay, secretes, these are these chemical warning signs. And our bodies can identify the invaders. They have the ability, our body cells, to recognize self cells and the, the um, proteins of non-self cells. So when an antigen is recognized, the body is going to go to work making something called antibodies. And antibodies are a type of immunoglobulin. And these proteins help to fight infection. And you can see the picture here that upside down Y is the antibody. And there's a foreign invader there, that red little sphere that you see, and it has some little spikes sticking off from it, right? And these um, antigen antibody complexes fit together like a lock and key. And there's only one specific antibody for each type of antigen. And so this is part of that, um, that immune process of how our body fights against foreign invaders. Now there is a, um, a disease, a condition rather, it is called A gamma globulinemia. And this is when the person is born without the ability to produce antibodies of any kind. And because of that, they are highly susceptible to infectious diseases. Now, they can perform a bone marrow transplant on these individuals, and it is extremely helpful for the individual. So that is something that can help them tremendously. Um, this is also referred to as humoral immunity. Humoral immunity is a system that is based on immunoglobulins or antibodies that are produced by B cells. Now there's two types of lymphocytes. There's B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes primarily. B lymphocytes um, are bursa derived and they were first identified in the bursa of birds. All right, so that's why they're called B cells. T cells uh, and, and uh, B cells, they typically kind of live, hang out, grow up in the bone marrow. And then T cells live, hang out, grow up in the thymus. All right, that's why um, that helps me to remember T cells, T for thymus. All right, and there's four different types of T cells. There's helpers, suppressors, cytotoxic T cells, and delayed hypersensitivity T cells. And they all help to establish something called cell-mediated immunity. As discussed, immune cells originate in the bone marrow as stem cells, and then they differentiate and turn into, develop into a variety of different specialized cells. Now back to cell-mediated immunity. Because uh, we saw that image, how the antibody will lock on to the antigen that is presented on the surface of the pathogen or the invader. So what that means is they can't enter into the cell. So cell mediated immunity is going to rely on those cells like um, macrophages, which are um, gigantic white blood cells that phagocytize um, foreign invaders and T cells to control infection. All right and it can control the cause, but it can't 
eliminate it. Um, and a good example of this is the herpes virus. So the herpes virus will um, enter the body, um, into the blood or whatever, and then it is going to start looking for, um, remember it's a virus, so viruses have to invade the host cell, hijack their machinery to be able to replicate. And so the herpes virus is on the hunt, if you will, for um, a, nor uh, uh, a normal cell, a normal host cell, right? So when it's moving through the body, it's going to be exposed to the antibody complement complex, and if it is, it is going to be destroyed. This is how that virus is going to be controlled. But if it gets into this, the, the host cell, right, if it makes it there and it gets into the host cell, then cell-mediated Im immune response is going to be able to destroy the infected cells. If the virus escapes the destruction of the cell, then it can become latent and it is going to take up shop along the nerves of the body and can lay dormant there um, for a time until this a situation occurs that triggers it to start um, you know its hunt all over again. So let's talk about hypersensitivity reactions. Now healthcare workers are at risk for developing some sort of hypersensitivity specifically to latex. And so sometimes this happens over time when you're exposed to something over and over and over again, your body can develop a hypersensitivity. And so with that specific example, we're talking about type one hypersensitivity reaction. So uh, other examples could be bee stings or certain medications. If you were giving a med given a medication when you were little and they say, oh, you're allergic to it, like penicillin might be a good example. A lot of people are allergic to that. That would be a type one allergic reaction, right? Now responses can be mild, like if you have contact dermatitis from wearing latex gloves, your skin might get a little bit red, a little bit itchy, but you're not gonna die. Um, to uh, type, uh, to the more severe types that can cause anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is the most severe and potentially life-threatening type that can lead to death, all right? Um, these types are divided into two primary categories, immediate, which is seconds to 24 hours and then delayed. So let's talk about type two sensitivity, hypersensitivity reactions. These are also called antibody dependent reactions and they are also immediate, similar to the type one. So type two allergic responses are cytotoxic reactions and we can see this when we give an individual the wrong blood type, right? Remember, we have different antigens that are displayed on our blood cells. And if we give an individual um, blood that has the positive rhesus factor, then um, it can attack, right? And so that could cause a hemolytic reaction. Um, type three is also called an immune complex reaction. And this involves some of those immunoglobulin antibodies. And uh, reactions are seen predominantly in autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. Lupus is another example of this. Uh, and then lastly, type four, which is called delayed type or cell mediated. And it does not directly involve antibodies, but involves hypersensitized T cells. Like these things are like itching to destroy something. 
and they secrete chemicals called lymphokines and um, this can lead to um, graft rejections that positive PPD test can also be due to exposure to latex or poison ivy or something of that sort. Um, again, type 1 is uh, referred to as immediate hypersensitivity, and it's probably the most common because, um, you know, if, if you were to ask anyone, they would probably identify being allergic or somewhat allergic to, to at least one thing, whether it's um, olive trees or strawberries or dust and dirt, pollen, any of those things. Um, it's definitely dependent upon a number of different antigens, um, their route, uh, how they get into the body, um, their production of immunoglobulins, and time between exposures. Again, that latex um, uh, exposure is what my mind goes to. Uh, typically, these reactions are very localized, like contact dermatitis or hay fever or if you get itchy eyes, runny nose, that kind of thing. As I mentioned, those anaphylactic reactions are potentially life-threatening hypersensitivity reactions. And when that happens, we're going to want to administer epinephrine, steroids, fluids, and vasopressors, and also 100% oxygen. Hemolytic transfusion reactions, again, this is when we give an individual the wrong type of blood, and this could be fatal for that individual without immediate treatment. Um, in the OR, what we're going to see is profuse bleeding at the surgical site, and there's going to be a decrease in oxygen. The treatment is to stop transfusing immediately as soon as it is noticed. That's why we check and double check and re-verify that we're giving the right patient the right blood. Um, so stopping transfusion, administering steroids, monitoring urine output, uh, and, and obtaining blood samples, and possibly dialysis is going to be the way that we treat an individual with a hemolytic transfusion reaction. We talked about RH incompatibility reactions in anatomy and physiology, and if you'll remember that positive or negative, that is next to your blood type A, B, A, B, O, that is the rhesus factor, named after the rhesus monkey uh, when they first discovered this phenomenon, right? That, that red blood cells do display an antigen, and if they do display the antigen, they're called positive. If they don't, they're called negative. So where we have a situation besides uh, blood transfusions and giving the wrong type of uh, the wrong rhesus factor of blood um, is when we have a pregnant female that is Rh negative and let's say um, dad was Rh positive and so baby has the positive rhesus factor. Um, the first pregnancy isn't really a concern, but the second pregnancy is going to be a serious concern because if there's another RH positive fetus, the mother's blood has now developed antibodies to fight that positive rhesus antigen and it will attack and kill the fetus. All right, so there's a, a drug that we can give called Rogam, and uh, that is pretty much a standard of care um, so that we can prevent, uh, it's called erythroblastosis fatalis. Autoimmune diseases like lupus, like rheumatoid, is when our immune system for some crazy reason starts to attack itself right and uh, sees the body's own self cells as 
foreign invaders, right? It's like friendly fire at this point. And uh, so rheumatoid is an example, lupus I gave. Multiple sclerosis is another example. Scleroderma, something called Reiter's syndrome or reactive arthritis, which can involve joints, urethra, eyes, and um, the, these areas become very edematous and inflamed. Crohn's disease is another one that occurs within the intestine. And with Crohn's disease, um, the sad thing about it is if we remove the infected, affected piece of colon, it can occur somewhere else in the colon. So resecting that area that is affected by Crohn's is not a be all end all for someone that has Crohn's disease. When we have, um, we can have some individuals with what's called single organ autoimmune disorders, which could be insulin dependent, diabetes, myelitis, or type one, Graves disease, remember that has to do with the thyroid, myasthenia gravis. Um, I, think, I think those are the, the predominant ones. Another type of hypersensitivity reaction is the delayed hypersensitivity or type 4 hypersensitivity. And it is unique to T cells that have become sensitized. And because of that, for some reason, they secrete substances in the absence of antibodies. So for example, uh, an antigen invades the body. The antigen is phagocytized and the T cells attach to the macrophage and are sensitized by the antigen, All right? When the sensitized T cell is exposed to the antigen again, it starts to secrete chemicals called lymphokines or cytokines that are produced by the lymphocytes. These lymphokines directly destroy the antigen. So an example could be the TB test. Uh, when you get the TB test, the, um, the localized reaction, we know we have to have it read within about 48 hours, um, and similar reactions can occur with poison ivy. Now, um, when we have a more serious reaction, that can be due to organ transplants. And um, this can cause the body to reject the transplant uh, organ or tissue. And that's why we do tissue mat matching so that we can um, find tissue or organs that are more closely related, like a family member is always a good option, a sibling, a parent, something like that. Um, but rejection follows this similar process. Um, however, there is an exception. Antibodies and those lymphokines um, are the cause of the transplant rejection. So in this case, the, that's why we give the patient immunosuppressive drugs. Um, both before surgery and then after surgery and uh, could be um, for the rest of time. Immunodeficiency disorders, we've talked about how our immunocompromised individuals are the ones that are at highest risk for developing other uh, infectious diseases. Um, and HIV is a, is, a, is a big one because HIV destroys the T lymphocytes. And um, so then our immune system becomes crippled. Um, there's about 180 plus um, uh, identified disorders that qualify as immunodeficiency disorders. Um, HIV, I said, is one of them. Maltri malnutrition is another. Chemotherapy is, uh, is another. Also, when we're really little, when we're babies, our immune system isn't as, as well developed. And as we age, our immune system starts to decline. 
Herd immunity is a really interesting phenomenon. It's also referred to as community immunity. And this means that if we have a, a majority of the population in a community that's vaccinated and has immunity to a certain disease, the chances are that those few people that are within the community that are not vaccinated or have immunity aren't going to get sick because we don't have really have the disease, right? Because we've been vaccinated. Um, the, the text gives an example of measles and indicates that approximately 95% of a community has to be vaccinated um, against measles for herd immunity to be effective. You may have heard of a man by the name of Andrew Wakefield. And Andrew Wakefield was a shady character who falsified research regarding the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and its link to autism. Uh, it finally did come out that he received a large amount of money from uh, a source that was looking to have a class action suit against the manufacturers of MMR vaccines. And so you may hear individuals say, you know, I'm not going to get my kid uh, vaccinated because vaccines cause autism. Um, that was proven to be completely false. Um, it was a big blatant lie. And now he's probably enjoying his three hots and a cot uh, as we speak. As we have talked about in the past, behavioral factors and socioeconomic factors greatly influence the um, the transmission and or prevention of diseases. Um, you know, Benjamin Franklin coined a phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's pretty easy and not too costly for us to prevent infection, but the treatment can be costly and in some cases, the cost could be someone's life. Now, behavioral factors do come into play and can have a great impact on disease transmission, such as um, sexually transmitted diseases, right? So the proper use of condoms and, you know, taking precautions to protect ourselves when we do um, engage in sexual activities. Um, careful preparation of food. Remember, there's a, 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 several microorganisms that can um, proliferate in meats and cheeses and milk. And so we want to make sure that those are cooked properly, pasteurized properly, canned properly, and all of those things. Um, sanitary conditions. The condition of the drinking water and the communities in which we live um, also greatly contribute. What about the, go the local government infrastructure? Is there, um, how are they supplying water? How are they preparing the water? What are they using to water their crops? Are they using pesticides? Um, those kinds of things. Um, you know, how are they treating their animals that they're raising for food? Uh, what living conditions do they have and can also contribute as well? Um, adhering to recommendations for routine vaccination, including us and our four-legged friends. And then, of course, proper hand washing and wearing proper PPE wearing the correct PPE and knowing how to wear it properly and then also knowing how to remove it properly so that we don't contaminate ourselves or uh, cause cross-contamination. 
So prevention of disease transmission in the surgical environment of care is um, based on um, scientific evidence of what works and what doesn't work. Environmental controls such as the number of air exchanges per hour. Remember we said 15 to 20 air exchanges per hour in the operating room. We've also talked about the use of HEPA filters and laminar airflow. Um, the temperature is regulated between 65 and 75 degrees. So the, the text says 68 to 73 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And um, you know the reason we do that is to reduce microbial growth. I, I don't know how many times when you wheel a patient into the OR and they're like, oh, it's freezing in here. You, you know, is this the meat locker? Or, you know, there's the, always the comments, did you forget to pay the electric bill? Like, why is it so cold in here? Um, and so that's one of the reasons, right? It's gonna retard microbial growth. We also want to make sure our floors, our cabinets, our walls, any surface in the operating room is non-porous and can be wiped down efficiently and effectively. And we also need to think about the contact times of those disinfectants that we're using so that we make sure that it's remaining on that uh, surface uh, for the recommended time so that it is doing the, the job that we need it to do. Attire and zoning. When we come into the OR department, um, that is a restricted area. And because of that, we have to be wearing our certain uh, PPE, like our hats and our booties and our surgical scrubs. And then when we are in, um, which would be considered semi-restricted in the department of the OR, there's also restricted areas, which means now we need to be wearing our masks. Um, skin prep. Prior to having surgery, they might ask the patient to wash their surgical site with some special soap. Hopefully that's going to reduce the transient flora that's on uh, and at the surgical site. Then when they come into the OR, we're going to, uh, or the circulating nurse typically, is going to prep the skin. And there are several different types of preps that we can use, ones that are alcohol-based, ones that are betadine-based, like a scrub and paint. Um, there's a variety of different types. We're also going to perform a surgical scrub, and that is going to hopefully remove the transient organisms and remove some of the resident flora as well. And then we're going to practice strict aseptic technique, and those are our three principles that we've been talking about during this class. Patient care items. Three different types of patient care items. They're classified as non-critical, semi-critical, and critical. And the non-critical items are items with the lowest potential for causing infection, which include blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, um, EKG leads, other items that only come into contact with the intact skin, maybe um, a device used for taking the temperature, uh, those kinds of things. And those can be cleaned with low level or intermediate level disinfectants. Semi-critical items are items that are going to come into contact with intact mucous membranes, such as the laryngoscope. If we are um, providing a general anesthetic for our patient, we're going to need to put in a tube so that we can breathe for them. And part of that process is the anesthesia care provider will use a device called a laryngoscope so that they can see down the throat and um, identify the vocal cords because that tube, remember, is gonna go between the vocal cords and down into the trachea and it's gonna be secured there. And then it's gonna get hooked up to some tubing, which is hooked up to a machine, which is gonna breathe for the patient. So a laryngoscope would be an example of a semi-critical item. Critical items are like our surgical instruments. Critical items that come into contact with non-intact skin or internal tissues, or that access the bloodstream, such as instruments, 
biopsy forceps, and hypodermic needles must be sterilized. No ifs, ands, or buts. Okay, so do you guys remember that question I asked you in the very beginning about are there varying degrees of sterility? Okay, so um, we may be getting close to the answer to that, so stay tuned. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about disinfection, decontamination, and sterilization. Now, disinfectants are chemical agents that have the ability to kill various classes of pathogenic microbes. Now, some of them are not able to kill spores, and those are the low level and the intermediate level type of disinfectants. Disinfectant is like, it could be a Clorox wipe, right? Those things that we use in our homes, we also use disinfectants um, in our homes as well, right? So low level disinfectants are not gonna kill spores, they're not gonna kill some fungi, and they're not gonna kill some viruses. And examples of this are quaternary compounds that we sometimes refer to as quats, okay? Um, intermediate level disinfectants do not kill spores and some viruses. And some examples of that are isopropyl alcohol and um, hypochloric, uh, so, sodium hypochlorate, sorry about that. Um, and so that is bleach, the sodium hypochlorate. Isopropyl alcohol, if we have a 60 to 70% concentration, is going to destroy most microbes. But again, it's not going to destroy anything that makes a spore, okay? It is not a sporicidal. High level disinfectants, now we're getting somewhere. These are gonna kill all microbes except microbial spores and prions. And some examples uh, would be Cydex, which is glutaraldehyde. Um, to render something sterile in glutaraldehyde, which is just a liquid in this special bucket um, where you soak the instrument in, has to be soaked for a very long time before it would be considered sterile. Um, so uh, typically we don't use this anymore. It's not very common, but um, for, it, for devices such as cystoscopes, colonoscopes, um, those kinds of things, um, they have used it uh, in the past. Uh, hydrogen peroxide can be used as a sterilant, but it has to be used in very high concentrations. And I believe the sterad is a type of um, sterilizer that does utilize hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so that's disinfection. Disinfection means it still has some bugs on it, okay? But we've killed some of them. We've killed some of the bacteria, we've killed some of the viruses, we've killed some of the fungi, okay? We probably haven't killed uh, the spores. Decontamination, the purpose of that is to reduce bioburden. And bioburden is the yuck that you can see that's left on an instrument or a surface. It's the blood, the bone, the, the fat, the bits of human that are left on there. All right. So decontamination is used to reduce bioburden, the schmutz, okay? And the decontamination process in regards to instrumentation begins in the operating room with the surgical technologist. We need to break down all of the instruments uh, that were assembled during the surgery. We need to open up all of those ratchets, um, no locked instruments, and uh, you know soak them in some water or spray them with enzymatic solution. Remember, this is going to start that process. It's also going to help out our friends in the sterile processing department. It is also going to help um, inhibit the formation of biofilms. B for bad, 
biofilms are bad. Now the moment that you've all been waiting for, sterilization. Sterilization is a process that renders something sterile, which means there are zero, if we do it right, zero living microorganisms. So the only time that we can use the word sterile is when we can verify that it has gone through a process that has rendered it void of any type of microorganism. Only then is it sterile. So the answer, is there varying degrees of sterility? No. It either is or it isn't. Okay, sterilization destroys all living microorganisms, including spores. Okay, now one example is steam sterilization. And how do we know that the steam sterilization process worked? Well, there's three things that we look at, three parameters. The time that it was exposed to the process, the temperature, which is uh, usually 275 degrees, Fahrenheit, did it reach that temperature, and the pressure. So time, temp, and pressure are going to be the things that give us the indication that it is sterile. There's also going to be a sterile indicator, and a biological is also something else that we can look at that we've talked about before. Chemical sterilization methods include hydrogen peroxide, uh, gas plasma, which is the sterad that I spoke of, Ethylene oxide, which is ETO, we've spoke about before, is very caustic gas that they can use to sterilize um, uh, instruments or whatever surgical stuff that is sensitive to heat. Uh, the sterad as well. Um, all of these chemical sterilization methods are okay for those things that are um, sensitive to heat. Glutaraldehyde, like I had mentioned before, that you have to soak for like a million years to render it, uh, render something sterile. Um, 10 hours, 10 hours in a glutaraldehyde bath, and then you have to thoroughly rinse that thing with sterile water because glutaraldehyde is extremely caustic and can damage tissues. Okay, fun stuff. Uh, and then the last one is parasitic acid, and uh, that is uh, vinegar. Uh, however, uh, the steris really is not something that we use anymore. Um, but uh, anyway, suffice it to say, the steris is, uh, is, uses parasitic acid to sterilize things. The um, sterilization process, right? We already talked about the use of chemical indicators and how that is going to be a sign that something's been sterilized. Biological indicators as well. They have those live spores living in them, right? And the chemical indicator, there's a variety of types, but type five is typically the type that we use. And for the biological indicator, do you remember the name of the spore for the steam sterilization process? Geobacillus sterothermophilus. So that brings us to the end of our discussion regarding the control of microbial growth. I hope that uh, you learned something. You might have had an aha moment. Maybe you chuckled or perhaps rolled your eyes. I'm not sure. Either way, um, I hope that this lecture has been beneficial to your learning. And thanks for listening.